Hey, how you doing, everybody? I jumped up here because I was supposed to have some notes in front of me, but that's okay. I talk about this stuff enough, so it should be fine. Uh, my name's Joey. As you said, I'm a photographer and director, uh, and the stuff I'm going to be showing you today is uh, my photography from Iraq and Syria, and I know that we are a tech audience mostly here, so I'm going to talk a lot about some of the technology behind the photographs. Um, but uh, basically what you're seeing tonight is uh, work from a project I've been working on for about three years. Um, in March it'll be three years and it's all coming out in a book of June this year called We Came From Fire, Kurdistan's Armed Struggle Against ISIS. So um, as the title suggests, uh, this uh, photography project looks at the war from the Kurdish perspective, the Kurdish armed groups that are on the ground uh, fighting against the extremist Islamic State, uh, ISIS. Um, basically, I have 15 minutes to talk to you tonight, so I can't really give you an, an entire uh, backstory of the entire Syrian civil war and what led up to it uh, to this point. But because we're a tech audience here, I know that um, there's a lot of interest in sort of the ideas of uh, arbitrary borders and uh, how the countries we know today were formed by mostly colonial powers and things like that. And that's where I, I find the Kurdish people so interesting because their ancient homeland is spread up across the modern day borders of uh, Tur uh, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. And again, I can't explain the whole conflict, but basically Kurds, as an ethnic minority living in the Middle East, have been repressed by those state powers uh, who have been actively trying to um, forcibly assimilate them into the state structure. If you skip forward to the recent conflict in the Middle East with ISIS uh, and other Al-Qaeda-linked groups uh, leading assaults against all those state powers, they were facing both a rebellion and, and a jihadist insurgency. So those traditional state powers actually retreated and they left Kurds on their own. So in a good way, the government that had repressed them fled but in a bad way, they were forced to defend themselves against these uh, genocidal maniacs. So these are the armed groups that my book uh, basically focuses on. But um, I want to say, like, in no way I'm a war photographer or have I been to any conflicts before this work. I don't really consider myself like that kind of style. What I actually come from is doing uh, cultural studies uh, and uh, projects on groups um, ethnic groups, minority ethnic groups that have endangered languages and endangered cultures. And you think about the Kurds being an ethnic minority in the Middle East, but as well as practicing some minority religions, the fundamentalists went to basically eradicate them. And that's why they fought so hard to defend themselves. So looking at the Kurdish plight and the Kurdish struggle seems somehow familiar, even though I hadn't been to a, uh, to a war zone. These were people who were defending themselves and defending their culture. So although I was afraid of every loud noise on my first trip, over time I got to know people, I worked with excellent locals on the ground, and I slowly uh, crept closer and closer to the front lines and what began as a portrait project um, gave me a little more confidence to look a little deeper. Um, but basically, a lot of, and again, we're a tech audience here, so in the book or in the photo series that I'm working on, there's a lot of uh, aerial photography that was captured with the most basic, uh, cheap consumer drones that are available to everybody now. I mean, to think about even doing this kind of uh, image making with this level of quality for so cheap even three years ago was just unheard of. So in the past, you would have to, I mean, I don't even, even know how you would do these kind of shots because you'd have to ride in a helicopter, which is an extremely dangerous or expensive thing in a war zone or be like the Nat Geo photographer George Steinmetz and literally strap uh, propellers to your back and fly around. But nowadays, it, you can do these things with you know, a $1,000 uh, drone. So this is aerial footage you're seeing uh, from a city called uh, Shangal in Iraq. And basically, the story here points to a few issues when using this kind of technology in the field. So this is a city where um, ISIS did uh, their genocide against the Yazidi religious minority. Uh, after a 15-month stalemate between them and Kurdish forces, uh, the Kurds actually threw ISIS out of the city, and they were just on the perimeter. So that means every single neighborhood is controlled by a hodgepodge of different Kurdish militants or 
Kurdish armed groups, let's say. They have a common cause in fighting ISIS, but there's some rivalry as well. Uh, that's the situation on the ground, but the situation in the sky, the sky is owned by the American Air Force, or what they like to call the coalition, but it's mostly just American airplanes doing airstrikes outside of the city. So of course, this is a thousand dollar drone. I could never uh, reach the altitude to ever mess with one of those uh, jets doing airstrikes. But at the same time, if you talk to fighters on the ground, they know very well um, that the Americans are actually testing uh, new technology and new equipment in the field, and they use the war against ISIS uh, in, in order to do that, however secretive it might be. So one sort of anecdotal situation is when I was flying this drone over an area where they were just doing airstrikes on the perimeter every couple hours, my drone suddenly got jammed with an electromagnetic pulse, and I was flying it on top of a rooftop, and at that point I was like embarrassed because I thought it had just fallen out of the sky. But then a rival militia to the one I was with started shooting at it because it was hovering over their area. And I didn't know like what the hell to do with myself. So I kept pressing the, um, like the fly home button, which is like what total noob flyers do. And eventually it uh, came back. But those guys in the other neighborhood, I mean, they have every right to shoot at a drone because although I'm using this kind of stuff for my ph ph uh, photography, the same technology we know is also being adopted for, let's say, more nefarious purposes. So these are actually pictures from uh, online from a former uh, Special Forces uh, soldier named Mitch Utterback. And basically, um, this is an ISIS drone that was shot down that you can see has been retrofitted with a small canister uh, to drop a grenade. So they're using the camera to line up a target, and they're dropping it. And uh, let's see, here's a video from, where else are they? Here's a video from another uh, loyalist militia that's demonstrating uh, how it works. Now, of course, this is never gonna take out the American Air Force. I mean, ISIS doesn't have a chance using these things, but they can become super effective at just disruption. And if there's a, a gathering of soldiers on a front line, they can easily fly over it drop small ordinance, and they have to scatter. So this is like a $1,000 technique that they're doing as, ins as insurgents. So that's a small example. But I'll show you an another video that's a bigger example. This loop is actually taken from uh, ISIS's media agency. Um, and it's showing one of their uh, DJI drones dropping a small bomb on what appears to be a stadium in a city called Deir Zor in Syria. Now this stadium is actually a weapons staging ground uh, for the Syrian government's army, Syrian Arab army, and they're storing all their uh, weapons out in the open. And you can see, even with a few small bombs, they ignite the entire place and they take out the entire stockpile of the army that they're fighting. So again, this is just a $1,000, $1,500 drone and you can see what they were able to do with it. I have to admit, it's actually pretty creative. But back to my work, I'm not using them for dropping bombs. I can tell you about uh, another project that I did in Iraq uh, utilizing uh, aerial photography. This is actually um, a project that I shot in collaboration with uh, Oxfam, the uh, NGO. So Oxfam is working on the ground and in uh, March to mid-2016, the Iraqi government and Peshmerga forces kicked off an offensive to remove ISIS from the city of Mosul and the surrounding area. And uh, basically, in anticipation of this offensive and the destruction that would happen uh, to civilian areas, Oxfam started to prepare themselves to uh, rebuild vital infrastructure, uh, help with uh, health problems and uh, things like that. But in a city called uh, Kyara, just before ISIS retreated, they actually did something to punish the civilians that had sided with the Iraqi army and turned against them. So uh, Kyara was a site of many oil wells that were nearby uh, neighborhoods. And I believe it was 18 that ISIS exploded uh, and as well as lit a 10,000 ton stockpile of pure sulfur on fire, uh, causing both an environmental 
uh, and a, human a humanitarian disaster in the region. So this is aerial footage actually flying over the city in Kyara. And if it looks like a video game, it was looking like that even through my eyes. There was no way to make it look somehow more real. It's uh, one of the most craziest uh, things I've ever seen in my life. But back to thinking about uh, aircraft and drones, of course, they did this to punish the civilians, but uh, ISIS, they actually had a tactical reason as well. Because when they light this oil on fire, what it does is very sort of like ragtag guerrilla technique. It's creating a black cloud over the entire area. And as they withdraw some of their vehicles, fighters, and heavy weapons, those coalition aircraft in the sky actually can't uh, strike them. So that's why they do it. But you can imagine at the humanitarian level, that's what we're focused on when we uh, collaborated with Oxfam. These people who live in this uh, city didn't necessarily want to evacuate their homes because of the uncertainty of living in refugee camps. They have no idea how long the offensive is going to last. Uh, for Mosul, it took a really long time. They don't want to leave their homes. So they're staying there, and they're breathing in these uh, toxic fumes. So when we got brainstorming with uh, Oxfam about how to tell this story, we're taking these photos for a fundraising campaign. Basically, it's an advertisement in a way, in a strange way. Um, we want to connect with people on a human level. So nowadays, I mean, more than ever, of course, we're bombarded with images, uh, with citizen uh, journalism from cell phones even. So stylistically, me as a photographer, like we have to think of something different so we can grab people's attention and hold it. And I think that's where uh, portrait photography can actually come in. Because unlike, I think, more like raw strands of photojournalism, you're allowed to do things to uh, make eye contact, be aware of the camera, just things that you can connect with the viewer. So that's portrait photography. But at the same time, we want to use drones and we want to use uh, aerials to obviously show the scope of what's happening uh, and the grand scale and size of, of everything. So this um, project was kind of like a mixture back and forth between like, let's say, uh, wide shots and portraits, wide shots and portraits, just to tell the story. Uh, on one of the most devastating days, one of the most devastating things I've ever witnessed was actually when uh, the local Iraqi firefighters were uh, trying to put out the flames. So they launched an operation one day. They're really poorly equipped, and uh, they failed, and it actually made the situation much worse. So they're trying to extinguish the flames. There was an issue with water pressure and they basically just added and the flames became like th maybe even more than three stories high. Um, this is a photograph that was actually taken of me like just on an iPhone and it was taken in the middle of the afternoon when the sun should be at its highest but you can see how dark it is. It looks as if it's the middle of the night. Uh, flying a drone in this kind of, uh, let's call it weather, is insane. I mean, the locals even dubbed it themselves as the ISIS winter because the black cloud spread out for uh, miles and was stuck there for months that it even affected agriculture. So I would fly the drone in the air. I'd have a visual uh, on my screen. I'd set up a, a shot, fly it back and forth, and within a couple minutes, the lens would be completely caked with uh, oil and grease. I'd have to rely on the navigation system to fly it back, land it, with the, hope of, uh, with the help of some local kids like spotting it in the air, uh, clean the lens, uh, wipe the propeller bl blades, and then change the battery and fly again. So if you can imagine, like that's what the drone looks like, you can imagine uh, what it's like for people like sleeping next to these, uh, these flames. Uh, this photo is uh, actually the highest in altitude I got when I was flying. Um, any higher and you start to dip into the zone of uh, the actual black cloud itself, you can see it on the left top edge there. Any higher and the screen just goes completely black. So this is again a little bit later in the afternoon and you can see uh, the sun starting to creep in uh, just to the, to the side, but again, it's in the middle of the day. This is a lower photograph. Um, it's a family going to the rooftop to look at the operation and uh, have a better view of it. And if you look really closely at the, uh, the kid on the staircase, this is the same kid. I went up to the rooftop to take portraits of the same people after. And he's actually being lit as a light source by that huge uh, wall of flames. 
Uh, so that's a, an, another connection of like aerial and portrait photography together. But I don't want to finish my talk on a total bummer. There are good ways in which these uh, technology and actually photography in general is being used. So the whole thing with Oxfam is they had to lead this whole effort to put pressure on the American coalition to actually do something. And it wasn't just Oxfam, there was a lot of NGOs. There were so many uh, news organizations syndicating my footage and my photos. And in a, there's not many photo success stories. To be honest, most photography is completely useless. But with these, we actually were able to put enough pressure on the coalition for them to intervene and actually uh, supply experts and better equipment and the flames were eventually extinguished. So sometimes like, I mean, there's a lot of creative people here. When I'm in a rut, I ask myself like, am I actually doing something? Like why did I become a photographer in the first place? And it's like very rare occasions like this where I can actually use my work to do good in the world. And uh, I think with portrait photography, it's kind of a cliche, but when you're making eye contact with someone, it's uh, very difficult to look away. So that's what I try to achieve with my work. Uh, thank you. It's so amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and those are where people should follow you. Um, seriously, the Instagram account is sort of sort of crazy. Um, just out of curiosity, how did your personal security work uh, when you were out there? Yeah, so um, the best thing is always to partner with uh, local people. They have a good sense on the ground. If you didn't live in New York City, you'd probably be a tourist in, in Times Square. You wouldn't see anything. So it's better to, in any country you go to, to go with local people who can speak the language, that are trustworthy, that have worked with other photographers and other journalists. Then after that, you just have to use your gut instinct and not take any risks. Um, but um, you should be clear with uh, when you speak to people to explain exactly what you're doing, and you have to put your trust in uh, people, I think. But. Um, do we have questions? If not anything uh, that you learned about, uh, let me grab this. About uh, so for somebody that wants to um, is completely amateurish uh, and wants to start taking some uh, like drone photography, like any so you'd recommend just like the DJI. Um, oh yeah. Any any model, any specific uh, hardware and software. I would say the most like the lightest and easiest one that you can actually bring and not be burdened by its size and weight. Like you wouldn't know how many times I'd like don't want to take the DJI Inspire because it's a huge case. Like it sounds stupid, but that small little like bit of resistance you get in your head can be everything. So I actually prefer like smaller portable ones and now they're making them so good that I mean even beside my medium format photography, sometimes they, they can hold up as part of the same cohesive series. So I would say something accessible but also somehow good quality. Yeah. How long did it take you at the very beginning to just learn the basics of how to fly this? Oh, um, basically nothing. I, I mean, we used, to, I, 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 we used to do commercials and stuff where we'd have to hire uh, a whole crew to bring their drone and it would have like someone to operate the camera, someone, it was like a whole thing. And uh, I mean, they made the technology so easy that like a complete dumbass like myself can not crash it uh, as much as I would. I've also crashed it a few times as well. S excuse my language, yeah. Of this kind of format, photography in the future, like specifically in uh, overseas kind of hostile environments, like is that is that something you see yourself doing more of? Not really. Um, like I said, like I'm not really interested in war in general. Um, I think uh, from the Kurdish perspective, it really drew me in for those cultural reasons that I talked about, like about defending a very unique language, but. As an example, like I wouldn't just go show up to any war zone because like it has to do with fighting. Like I don't think that's the narrative thread that ties it to together. And I think there's a lot uh, more talented photojournalists that are equipped to do that. Um, that like that's their job. And uh, I guess I'm more in the realm of uh, portrait photography.
So I guess doing drones with uh, disappearing cultures might freak them out a bit. Have you taken them out to like up in the hills in Papua New Guinea or wherever where they kind of freak out seeing a drone? Yeah, um, I've actually taken a drone to southern Ethiopia, some uh, agro-pastoralist uh, indigenous communities. And I mean, it's kind of funny, to be honest, they act the same way as kids would in any place. Like I could launch a drone here and people are pretty amazed. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, um, everybody has a different reaction. Some people are scared, but um, for the most part, um, everybody finds it pretty interesting. That's why that, that giant foam thing is on there. Oh, these are all football. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, all right, so if we, uh, if we good, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll uh, save some time for the last uh, speaker. But thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, everybody. This was amazing. Thank, thank you. you.